There are so many benefits to remodeling or improving your home. Shouldn't your family's health be one of them? Researchers have linked indoor air pollution and other exposures in homes to both chronic and acute diseases. Most of us, especially children, spend more time inside than outside, a lot more time. So the air that we breathe and the things that we touch indoors really matter. Yet the primary focus of health and environmental regulations are on the outside environment and in industry. So it is up to us, people who live in the homes, to make sure that they are healthy. Housing affects health both directly and indirectly in many ways. So let's take a look at some of the options and possibilities for us to improve the healthfulness of our own homes. Indoor air pollution, surprisingly, is typically much worse in our homes than it is outside, even in industrial areas. The type, the number of pollutants and the level of them tends to be much higher indoors. For those who suffer from asthma, there are many potential triggers. There's mold, uh, tobacco smoke, of course, dust mites are a major trigger, as well as the, um, the droppings and the residue of insects and other critters. Any type of fuel burning appliance produces combustion pollutants, including carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, particles that we can breathe in and, and are not good for our lungs, as well as moisture in the air and what that produces. These combustion co contaminants tend to be worse when the equipment is not maintained or the flame is not adjusted properly. If the flame is yellow, then it is not hot enough and it's not going to have complete combustion and will therefore give off more carbon, mon carbon monoxide. So make sure everything is serviced annually. Okay, who's got the allergies here? It's normally the people we're more concerned about, and the cat is the source of allergens, along with all of these other common indoor air contaminants. Allergic health effects is what affects the most people, and there's a lot we can do to prevent it. We don't often think about volatile organic compounds, VOCs it's often referred to. Anything that gives off fumes uh, is giving off volatile organic compounds. So if it has a smell, that's a VOC. Some of them are harmless, but there are thousands out there, and we don't even know the effects of many of them. And many of them are not harmless, so be sure to read labels on all sorts of finishes and common products. Homes built before 1978 could have lead-based paint. The older the home, the more likely it is to have some lead-based paint. This can pose a major hazard if disturbed in a remodeling project. The greatest risk is to young children and expectant mothers because lead poisoning, even small amounts, can affect the developing brain as well as hearing and other organs. It can lead to um, behavior disorders, learning disabilities, and so it's something that we want to definitely be on alert to, and we'll talk more about how to prevent such remodeling hazards. If there's a flood or other types of storm damage, that opens a Pandora's box of potential hazards, particularly with a great deal of of mold, perhaps sewage, chemicals, debris, and the stress of the situation. Which leads us to mold. Mold is a type of contaminant that is really part of nature, so you can't completely avoid it. The problem is when it grows inside of a home and the colonies become large. Tiny spores travel in the air and they will settle on surfaces and if it's wet, if it has enough wetness for long enough, that's when growth occurs. 
and it the population grows exponentially so time is of the essence to stop it before it really gets rolling what is the health hazard well it's really kind of a fuzzy science because there is not a clear dose response threshold as would be the case with some other types of contaminants um, it depends upon what the level of exposure is which is very hard to determine it also depends greatly on the sensitivity of the person uh, people with weakened immune systems the very young the very old those with other respiratory conditions are more sensitive other factors can add to the risk and then the type of mold and whether or not it produces a toxin is a factor as well in the potential health effect we sometimes hear about toxic mold what that's not really an appropriate term but some types of mold can produce mycotoxins in certain conditions they can be carried in the spores that travel around the air the key thing to keep in mind is that these toxins and also the other effects of mold are there whether the mold is dead or alive it can have the exact same health effects so it's important to realize that and just killing mold is not a total solution. Home safety is just as important as indoor air quality because there are many accidents in the home that are preventable. To have a healthy home we want to think about and consider in your remodeling projects these seven principles of healthy housing. Keep it dry, keep it clean, keep it well ventilated, keep it safe, keep it free of contaminants, keep it pest free, and keep it well maintained. Let's look briefly at each one of those. First of all, plan your home improvements in such a way to help keep your home dry. Be sure that rainwater drains away. Manage the movement of moisture. Try to prevent condensation in hidden places and protect against plumbing leaks. Moisture control is the number one key to preventing mold problems, but it also helps to control dust mites and it reduces pests and the off-gassing of some VOCs such as formaldehyde. Houses have always had components that got wet. It's not a big deal if they can dry quickly, but they need to be able to dry within two or three days to prevent the growth of mold. So water managed assembly of materials is so important too. If you're adding on to the home, adding a carport, a balcony, or any architectural feature or even landscaping around the house. Maintain a slope, a downward slope away from the house. Water that flows from the roof and down the, ha the walls needs to move away from the foundation. Be sure no water runs towards your foundation or under your home because that is a major source of moisture migration into your home. If any construction will occur or any reciting, be sure the contractor properly installs what we call a drainage plane, a weather barrier system to keep all the water out of the wall assembly and to make it drain down and outward. It's hard to find uh, drainage planes done exactly right, but it's even harder to do it later after the fact. The weakest links are generally the detailing around windows and doors. Flashing should provide complete protection of the window sill and the corners before the window is installed. So if windows are being replaced or additions are being added on and new windows installed, be sure they are properly flashed and every component is integrated in a shingle fashion as you would with roof shingles. To keep your home dry, it's also important to understand relative humidity and to manage it as well. 
relative humidity is not just the amount of moisture that's in the air or water vapor that's in the air. It's the amount of water vapor in the air relative to or compared to the amount that the air could hold at that temperature. You see, if you had a block of air that had a certain amount of moisture in it and it was warm, then you cooled that block of air down, it would get to a point of saturation eventually where it could not hold as much moisture at a cold temperature so the moisture in the air would condense, turn from the gas or vapor form to liquid. That's condensation. That's what occurs on the outside of a glass of ice water because the air in the room, the warm air, reaches that cold, cold surface of the glass and the moisture in it condenses on that. It's not water coming through the glass, it's from the air. And that can happen in hidden places or even on the surfaces of our home where warm, moist air touches a cold surface. So that's helpful to control mold as well as dust mites. Mold, it will not take hold if the relative humidity at a surface is below 70%. But even less known is that dust mites must have a high relative humidity in order to reproduce. So the best long-term control of dust mites for people who suffer from asthma and allergies is to maintain an indoor relative humidity below 50%. That's a key, key fact. So indoor humidity control is very important to control the biological contaminants and have good indoor air quality, particularly in the southern warm, humid climate. And the more energy efficient the home, the more important it is to take extra measures for good humidity control. And that's because normally Air conditioning your home or heating your home reduces that relative humidity indoors. But when your home's very energy efficient, you don't need much heating, you don't need much cooling. But the same amount of humidity is there and gets generated by the activities in our home. So that's why you really need to give a lot of attention when you weatherize and you make energy improvements to make sure that you're not going to have that you have um, that you're not going to have a lot of moisture wicking through the slab or the foundation of your home that there are barriers and waterproofing to that good exhaust fans effective exhaust fans properly installed are needed and it's important to not oversize an air conditioning system if you weatherize that could make your air conditioner a little bit oversized or if you're replacing a system be sure that calculations are made and not a rule of thumb to determine the right size for the details and the level of energy efficiency of your home. Bigger is not better. Oversized air conditioning systems that are too many tons for your, for your particular house will short cycle and will not dehumidify adequately. Choose air conditioning systems with a large dehumidification capacity if you're shopping, ask for that. And if all of this still doesn't quite cut it to keep your relative humidity as low as you would like to, particularly for dust mite control, you might want to consider adding either a whole house dehumidifier or a portable dehumidifier. Choose one that's Energy Star rated. Put it somewhere where you can have a drain line so you don't have to empty a reservoir and realize that it does produce some noise and it does use some energy but it's better to have humidity control and to spend some energy on dehumidification than to over air condition and over cool to get it or to waste energy with an energy with an inefficient home understanding the flow of moisture both liquid and water vapor can help you avoid problems as well the natural physics of it is that moisture will be driven to flow from warm sides of the building to the cold side of the building and also from where there's more moisture to where there's less. Warm to cold, more to less. So 
So that means in warm weather, when you're air conditioning inside, there's a natural drive for moisture to try and come inward to flow through materials and through the building from outside to inside. In the cold weather, it's reversed. It wants to go from in to out. So that's a clue to prevent problems like this. Basically, if you have warm, humid weather outside, really cool air conditioning inside, and then vinyl wallpaper, that is a recipe for mold behind that vinyl and in a very unhealthy kind of mold also. Why does that happen? Because the air conditioning makes the vinyl cold, the moisture drive is inward, but the moisture cannot get through the vinyl to dry to the inside and it wets the paper facing on the drywall. Perfect food and moisture for mold growth. So the lesson of that is if you have a lot, a long air conditioning season, never install vinyl wallpaper on the exterior walls of a home. Again, moisture control to keep it dry. Use every method there is in your home remodeling project to make the water drain down and out, both with slopes, design, and assemblies and also to reduce air infiltration because that brings in the humidity from outdoors and to remove the, the moisture, the humidity that we generate indoors. Good maintenance is key to that as well. Principle number two is keep it clean. So design and select your home improvements and select materials that are very easy to keep clean. Easy care, smooth surfaces that are non-absorbent and, and avoiding dust collectors and nooks and, and rough materials. And think about also shoe cubbies at the family entry. So you can put all your dirty stuff there and not track the outside soil through the house. Of course, it's also important to put in your contract with your home improvement contractor to do thorough cleanup at the end of the project and to try and keep the area as clean as possible during the project. Principle number three is make home improvements to keep your home well ventilated or properly ventilated. Yes, we want an energy efficient home and we want it tight, but we do need the right kind of ventilation for good air quality. Basically, spot ventilation to carry moisture and contaminants outside at the source where they're produced. We do need some fresh air to dilute the off-gassing, the VOCs and the odors that we generate inside. And we need to distribute and control and filter the flow throughout the house. First and foremost, good exhaust fans that are properly installed and actually do what they're designed to do. You can test the draw on them and see if, if they're really pulling. The big key is the way the ductwork is designed. It not only needs to go to the outside of the home, make sure that they're not exhausting into your attic because that is just depositing the moisture in the wrong place. But the duct needs to be installed to manufacture specifications. It should not make U-turns or S-curves or have dips. If any of that occurs, it's not going to have the rated airflow and you will not be getting what you pay for. The other thing is invest a little more in exhaust systems that are very quiet so the family is willing to use them when they should be used. Although source control and spot ventilation are always first priority, air filters on your heating and air system can be helpful to capture and remove some contaminants that may be in your home, at least those that happen to go through that air filter. There is a standardized rating system called the MERV rating that's uh, based upon the size of the particles and the efficiency of the filter to capture them. The higher the number, the more that is captured and the finer the, the particles that they can capture. However, 
do be cautious that the very, very high MERV filters can reduce airflow beyond what is um, suitable to your particular equipment and, and the design of your system. So be sure that the MERV rating that you choose for your filter is appropriate to your, your heating and air system. For most homes, MERV filters in the range of 10 to 12 um, give the good balance of both airflow and uh, contaminant filtration. These illustrations depict a very common type of undesirable ventilation. On the left, you see where there's an air handling unit and the ductwork is in a vented attic. Well, if that ductwork is leaky, which is often the case, it's very common for ductwork to leak about 30% of all the air going through it, what happens is it's pulling air from the home, it leaks into the vented attic, which is outdoors, and supplies back to the house less air than it took out. That creates a negative pressure or a suction, causing infiltration of humid air or outdoor air through the building and the nooks and crannies. What is it picking up? through those building cavities and nooks and crannies. Could be pesticides, could be insect residue. That is not the healthy way to have ventilation. Then, look at the illustration on the right. To make matters worse, what is often the case is there is only one return where the filter is to go to the air handler. It's in a common central area of the house. Then we have bedrooms and shut the doors when we want privacy uh, at times. And what happens there is then the air that's supplied to the bedrooms cannot get back to the central area. So the bedrooms are pressurized like a balloon causing air to exhaust out. And then that common area really goes negative in a big way creates a huge suction and tends to draw air infiltration in from wherever it can, which is often the attic. One of the dustiest, most unhealthy sources of air you can imagine. What is this? No, it's not just a uh, you know, street from the door. That is from the phenomenon we just talked about, where the bedroom has been pressurized with the door shut the air is trying to get back to the filter, and so it goes through the carpet, which is acting as a filter, capturing the dust that, that is coming through under that space. So that is a true telltale sign that you've got a pressure imbalance problem in your home. There are easy solutions, air transfer grills. You can have the old style transom, or you can have um, systems that provide baffles for sound and light. So you still get the airflow through, but without the light and, and less sound transmission, so you maintain privacy. Make improvements to keep your home safe. Take measures to correct items that create fall hazards. Correct electrical hazards by installing ground fault circuit interrupters in all damp and wet locations. And of course, be sure you have operating smoke alarms and fire extinguishers mounted. To prevent slips, trips, and falls, be sure you have excellent lighting in all locations of the home, particularly at entrances and that the switches are very easy to find and to reach. Handrails, check them to be sure they're secured to structural components and not just to the drywall. Steps and ramps need to be appropriately designed for safety. Ramps should not be too steep because that can be a hazard for anyone using a wheelchair. And avoid uh, planning sunken rooms that have just one step in a level change that is so easy to miss and a very common source of, of falls. 
Consider installing blocking in any additions or bathroom remodelings in particular where you could install grab bars or get decorative ones that look good but are, are very handy and convenient. And of course, analyze your flooring and the finishes that you use on them and the rugs that you place to make sure that they can't slip and they don't create a slippery surface. And of course, dangerous uh, substances that young children might get their hands on should be in high or locked storage as well. Child proofing is crucial even if you don't have young children because your home could always be visited by young children. Increasing security with good deadbolts, um, a way to see visitors before you open the door, and of course good lighting perhaps with automatic uh, features to it so you don't have to remember to turn on your security lighting. Part of a safe home really should be giving some thought to the concept of universal design. What that is is designing for life for all ages and stages of the life cycle. Your home doesn't have to look like a handicap uh, accessible house. Basically people who have features that are adaptable, that are flexible, and that accommodate people whether they're standing or sitting are often found to just be handier, more convenient, more functional all the way around. But try to make sure that your home is at least visitable by someone who does use a wheelchair where they can get in, get out, and, and use a restroom. And in any remodeling, include those clearances and some of these features for a lifetime home. Safety doesn't have to look uh, obtrusive. It can have style. It can be beautiful along with the convenience. Principle number five is to make improvements to help you keep your home free of contaminants of all the different sources. First of all, if your home is damaged by flooding or a storm, Keep in mind the many hazards that could be there when you return that you may have to deal with in that restoration and cleanup process. There are a lot of misconceptions about mold. Uh, let me touch on some of these briefly. One is that black mold is worse than other mold. Basically that's a meaningless term. Many types of mold are black. That was coined by the media and it, it, it doesn't have any relevance. Basically any kind of mold can be a hazard uh, as a potential health threat or effect so it should be dealt with no matter what type it is. And for that reason if you see mold or you smell mold it is there and there really generally is not useful to do testing to find out the type better to spend your time and resources on remediation and cleanup and drying and prevention than on testing. Is it mildew or is it mold? Basically mildew is a type of mold. The distinction between them is meaningless as, as well. And then some people think after disasters that very heavy mold growth on the surfaces of, of materials make the home a total loss. That's not the case from a structural standpoint. It can be a very expensive process to totally remediate a, a very heavy um, mold infestation, but mold does not penetrate solid wood. So if there is a wood frame structure, and perhaps brick veneer or solid wood siding or other materials, it is strictly on the surface so it does not affect the structure. Now decay fungi can um, damage the structural integrity of wood but not surface mold. Bleach is not the end all cure to solve mold issues because remember dead mold spores can have the same effects as live mold. It's just that killing mold keeps it from reproducing. So there are sometimes um, it can be useful to use a disinfectant, particularly if there's contamination by bacteria or sewage, but it is not the end-all cure. It's best to always remove it. 
The other misconception is, is the concept that, that you need to wait for an insurance adjuster before you start cleanup. Not true. Take pictures, but as soon as it is safe to return and to enter a home, it, it's time to start the cleanup process. If you do have a mold problem, whether it's from a flood or some other situation, it's important that the cleanup be handled as safely and thoroughly as possible. It's always best to hire a, a licensed or certified professional with specialized equipment, but that isn't always possible for some people. So whether it's a pro professional doing it or you end up having to do it yourself or with volunteers. Um, be, be sure that whoever is doing the work follows these guidelines or take them even further. First of all is personal protection. You want to minimize the exposure of the workers and anyone around to, to the mold. At the very least, for small jobs, an N95 respirator, it's not the same as a dust or a paint mask. Rubber gloves and boots are crucial. For big jobs, full protection like the professionals wear is best. Try to isolate the moldy area from other areas of the home because any cleanup process generally will release massive spores in, in when they're disturbed and you want to keep them from traveling to the clean areas of the home through the air. So seal it off, stop the air conditioning system, close off or tape off the vents, uh, perhaps hang plastic in the stairways, and try to draw any airborne spores outdoors by putting a fan in a window blowing to the outdoors and on the opposite side of the, of the moldy room or area opening another window so that it's drawn outward. Also consider the source of the wetness. If it's from rising flood water, flood water is generally considered contaminated because there could be anything in it. There could be sewage, there could be chemicals, um, but if the water is from a leak in the roof or a leak in plumbing, then that is a clean water source and you may not have those other contaminants um, and the biological issues to deal with. In general, <coughs> porous materials that take in flood water will usually need to be replaced. It's best to remove them and to discard them rather than try to clean them and salvage them, except perhaps valuable rugs that can be taken somewhere else to clean. But always the padding should be discarded. Never try and salvage the padding of carpeting or upholstery. Fibrous insulation like fiberglass or cellulose or open cell spray foams will not dry out readily enough and cannot be cleaned, so they should be removed. Even if the wall appears to dry and look okay, so you hate to cut into that drywall, it needs to happen. Otherwise, problems will occur later on because that insulation will not allow uh, materials to dry quickly enough. Uh, particle board would need to go drywall it depends. If it's very, very moldy where the mold has eaten into the paper, it needs to be replaced and removed. If there is no wet insulation behind it, and if it's strictly a little bit of surface mold, sometimes that can be cleanable. If there is a lot in particular, it can be helpful to reduce that massive release of spores to cover moldy areas with plastic, tape it on, cut around it, bag it in heavy bags and discard it and, and that can reduce the release into the air. Then surfaces, uh, materials that can be cleaned to literally clean away the mold would be the, the solid materials like solid wood can be cleaned, concrete, metal, hard plastic, um, undamaged drywall that doesn't have insulation behind it. Um, those are cleanable. I we generally recommend or suggest using non-phosphate cleaners. Uh, the phosphates work really well, but the non-phosphate, um, but the phosphates can leave a residue, and those phosphates then become food for the growth of new mold. So 
um, choose the types that are phosphate free. If there is sewage or something else where you need to sanitize um, and you want to use bleach or another type of disinfectant, it's best to clean first then go back with the sanitizing because the soil could use up, um, could oxidize all of the, the bleach or the disinfectant and then it would not have any effect to actually do that job. If there is sewage contamination, then you really do need to disinfect and you can't just use a cleaner. But keep in mind, disinfectants are toxic chemicals as well. That's why they work. They are biocide. They are meant to kill. So they are hazardous to humans as well. You need personal protection, but realize that they um, handle them carefully. Also, many of them, including bleach, have no residual effect, so they don't continue to deal with any new growth later. Bleach may last 15 or 20 minutes, then it dissipates and it's gone. Also keep in mind that bleach can kill mold if it's in contact long enough, but dead mold has the same health effect as live mold, so it's not a complete solution to the hazard. It's best to clean it away, replace materials and clean it away as much as possible. If you do need to use bleach or another dis or as your disinfectant, it is a very inexpensive option. Generally, a half cup to a cup to a gallon of water will create um, an adequate disinfecting solution, but follow the directions on the label for its use as a disinfectant. They do have new ultra-type uh, products that are concentrated where you'd need less of the bleach per gallon of water. Keep in mind, too, that bleach is very corrosive to metals, so do not use it on metals or anywhere in or near your air conditioning system because that can cause uh, corrosion to it to components on the inside that you would not be able to see. Uh, it can also damage fine woods of, say, your furnishings, as well as um, bleach out the color in and fabrics and materials that are not color fast. There are other alternative disinfectants, and there are some newer products on the market that use a, a different means to um, create a, a physical um, barrier or encapsulate mold. So you may want to look into those as well. After the cleanup, and if needed, disinfection, then a step that is so important that sometimes gets missed is the importance of trying to speed up the drying process. When people say, I, I did all this cleanup and it came back, it is not the same mold, it is new mold that has grown on wet surfaces. So if something stays wet for more than two or three days, then that is enough time for new mold colonies to start. So that's why after cleaning, if there is power available, Use air conditioning and heaters and fans as much as possible. Close up the house and use those. Add a dehumidifier if you can. The lower you can make the relative humidity, then the faster the materials will dry. That is what drives the, dry, the drying. If there is no power, then of course open windows and ventilate. But in hot, humid conditions, that will be very, very slow. Then wait until everything is dry before restoring, before putting insulation back, before closing up the walls so that you don't end up by slowing down the drying process. After all of this, inspect often and sniff. Remain on mold alert. Um, continue to dehumidify as much as possible. If you detect a musty odor, that means that there's active growth of colonies and you need to repeat the cleanup process or hire a pro. 
if your home is in a hurricane or a high wind zone, remodel to reduce the risk of wind damage. If you have a gable end roof, that is vulnerable, so bracing in the attic can strengthen your roof to reduce the chance of collapse. Whenever you re-roof, reinforce the roof decking with ring shank nails, which provide a lot of resistance to pull out. Never staples. They don't hold. Consider adding a secondary water barrier by taping the seams of the decking, so if you do lose some roofing, there will be less water damage. And use the synthetic roofing felts or a peel and stick type underlayment that is much more tear resistant than your standard roofing felt. Choose roofing materials that are rated for high wind and for hail resistance. Most of the time the manufacturer instructions will require six nails per shingle instead of just three and a specialized starter strip for the first course. Be sure manufacturer instructions are followed and be very clear with the installer about the need for that because it is a little bit different from standard shingles. Add metal straps or hurricane connectors to connect every component together that you can access from the roof to the foundation. That creates what's called a continuous load path and ties all the parts of the house together. In a wind event, it's kind of like taking a house, turning it upside down, and shaking it. That's what it goes through. So adding these components, whether they're inside or outside, every little bit helps. Flood resistant materials can reduce damages from the next flood if you are in a flood zone hazard. So choosing floorings um, alternatives to carpeting that would need to be replaced the next time there's a flood situation. Also floorings that do not have a paper backing to them or do not have a composite type material that would need to be replaced after a flood. There are many beautiful alternatives. Consider mold resistant materials in any home remodeling and restoration. That would be everything, and decay resistant materials too, everything from borate treated woods and borate treated insulations to drywall with no paper facing but a fiberglass matting instead, and acrylic latex paints with a mildew side in them, solid type uh, through and through flooring materials, insulated windows because you'll have less condensation issues with them, and then choosing windows and door materials that um, are more mold and decay resistant because they are fiberglass or vinyl or have metal cladding on them. Consider elevating any appliances, wiring, and utilities in a remodeling to get them high above a potential flood level in your home. And there are some wonderful options, including the front-loading washer and dryer up on drawers or platforms that lift them up from a low-level flood, but they're also more energy efficient and water efficient. As we indicated before, in this remodeling process, be sure you're not creating a lead-based paint hazard. Assume, unless you get a professional inspection or testing done, assume that a pre-1978 home could contain lead. Check regulations, and if you hire a contractor, be sure they are an EPA lead certified renovator. They will have a certificate from EPA with their picture on it. Anyone who does um, lead, uh, not just lead abatement, but who does any kind of work that could disturb lead-based paint should have personal protection. The space should be isolated. And whoever does the work should avoid any kind of procedure, any paint removal or, um, or deconstruction procedure that creates lead dust. Either they can use specialized equipment, 
special sanders with a HEPA vacuum attached to it, or using wet methods of spraying and scraping and capturing all of the paint chips. Do not use sanders or, or chemical strippers or torches to remove paint because all of those create a lead hazard in the air. Cleanup must be meticulous and, um, and thorough in capturing all of the dust created during the process. Try to restore with, with surfaces that provide easy care and easy maintenance. If your home is older, it may also have asbestos. If asbestos containing materials are in good condition, just leave them alone. They, don't, they are not a hazard if embedded within their material. The problem is created when certain types of asbestos materials are disturbed or broken or sanded or those kinds of things. So it's better to cover up asbestos flooring with new flooring than to remove the old flooring. Again, there are um, licensed or certified contractors for removing asbestos uh, insulation or other hazardous materials. Try to prevent combustion contaminants from entering your home. If you have any type of combustion equipment or appliance, it should at the very least have exhaust ventilation to the outdoors. The best of all is to have a type called direct vent sealed combustion appliances. So if you have a fireplace or another indoor space heater, consider the type that brings in its combustion air from outdoors ducted into a sealed chamber and back out again. That is the safest alternative, particularly for a fireplace. If you have a gas cooking stove, be sure you have a good exhaust and a quiet exhaust that so people will use it, a hood over that range. And it can be helpful, particularly in, in tight homes, are homes with various um, combustion appliances that are not direct vent sealed combustion to get someone to inspect and make sure that nothing is backdrafting. All combustion equipment should be inspected at the beginning of each season to be sure that they are not spilling um, combustion gases into the home and even an attached garage can pose a hazard. The wall that connects it, the doorway, and any penetrations through that wall should be sealed perfectly airtight and it can be helpful to try and ventilate that garage to the outdoors to prevent the exhaust from cars from being drawn into the home by negative pressure when you use exhaust fans. A carbon monoxide alarm is a great addition in any remodeling, or it can even be a plug-in model. They should be placed near the sleeping areas. It's best about five feet up, and the types that are, the, the, I think, the most useful are the ones that have not only an alarm, but have a digital readout. So you can look at them periodically and see if you're getting low-level carbon monoxide that's lower than what would set off the alarm, but still can be unhealthy. When choosing finishes, cabinetry, um, carpeting, or all kinds of materials, look on the labels and try to select low VOC products. That's products that will have um, much lower levels of volatile organic compounds or fumes that can be unhealthy. Carpeting um, can be uh, participate in the Green Label program, that's a voluntary program, but Green Label carpeting will have less, less off-gassing than others, but it's always still a good idea when you get new carpeting to request that it's aired out and try to ventilate your house for about three days when it's brand new. EPA recommends that every home be tested for radon. Some areas have lower risk than others, 
but it's always a good idea to be on the safe side to at least get the short-term type of test as a screening tool and then if the, the result shows four um, picoliters or higher, then try a long-term test and follow up to see if any measures need to be taken to reduce radon. Radon is a naturally occurring soil gas, radioactive soil gas, that can, over years of time, lead to lung cancer and other conditions. It's the second leading cause of lung cancer after tobacco smoke. The sixth healthy housing principle is make improvements to keep your home pest free with integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is a concept of making um, your home free of pests but with the least use of toxic chemicals as possible. And it's a strategic way to do it by blocking access to entry, food, and water and removing places that attract and that can, can harbor or hide pests. Integrated pest management um, can make dramatic reductions in both the, the use of pesticides and in the species of pests that can invade your home. It can do an efficient job of getting rid of pests for the long term and reduce the environmental and the health hazards associated with widespread and overuse of pesticides. Here are some um, ways in which to seal up holes and penetrations that pests could get into. Notice the copper mesh that, um, that rodents cannot chew through can be more effective for, for large, um, large holes and gaps. For termite resistance, consider investing in borate pressure treated woods Consider using types of materials that are naturally more uh, termite and decay resistant without the need for added chemicals and treatments. Principle number seven is keep your home well maintained. So improvements that make that easy are always a good idea and they create uh, a home that will be more durable and less work for you so you have more time and money to enjoy doing other things. So it can be a really worthwhile investment to invest in long warranty roofing, long warranty windows, and other products. Pressure treated woods, long lasting materials like masonry, fiber cement, treated siding, um, the plastic lumber or the pressure treated deckings and then longer warranty easy care types of appliances and materials. Be sure your foundation is designed for your soil conditions particularly if the soils are the type that expand and contract readily which is pretty common in the south. Begin with a thorough home inspection to look for problems before they become big problems, especially those that deal with, with water and moisture control. There is a wealth of more information online to help you create and enjoy a healthy home. Visit the epa.gov forward slash IAQ site to learn more about indoor air quality. Visit HUD.gov to explore their healthy home materials, programs, and see a copy of Help Yourself to a Healthy Home Booklet. The National Center for Healthy Housing, NCHH.org site, has a variety of materials which you can download, as well as being a national leader in research, training, and policy. And, of course, you can visit our own La House Resource Center website. Click on the My Home button to see a wide variety of articles on how to improve your home, both to make it healthy as well as energy efficient 
and durable. And you're invited to explore the hundreds of high-performance housing exhibits at La House Resource Center, either through its website or in person. It's open to the public Monday through Friday on the LSU campus in Baton Rouge. La House is a showcase of solutions designed for the southern climate. It was built with four high-performance building systems, 10 different kinds of windows and doors, many, many features including moisture management, healthy home, indoor air quality, universal design, as well as energy efficiency and disaster resistance. Here's wishing you a happy, healthy home.